I want to talk to you about the call of God that's on your life. We're continuing my series, God's Anointed, and on this edition of Spirit Church, I'll be talking about the prophet Isaiah. We're going to be looking at how he was called by the Lord when he glimpsed the glory of God. And from that point on, Isaiah was used as a mouthpiece of heaven. So we're going to look at the call of Isaiah. We're going to glean truths from his life concerning the call of God, and then we're going to apply it. And I believe that the call of God on your life is closer than you think it is. In fact, most people imagine that the call of God is something that comes later in their life, but the call of God is right here, right now, and I want to stir your faith today to step into that call. Stephen Moctezuma is here with me as usual. He's going to lead you in worship, and then we're going to get right into this lesson on Isaiah the prophet. Here is Stephen Moctezuma. In your presence there is freedom in your presence there is hope in your presence there is healing love restores me i am whole no matter how far i run you are with me no matter how far I fall, your love is everlasting, your kindness never ends, God you'll never leave me, and your presence goes before us, your glory has no end, God you'll never leave Your love is everlasting, your kindness never end, God you'll never leave me, yeah. Your presence goes before us, your glory has no end, God you'll never leave me. Your love is everlasting. Your kindness never ends, God, you'll never leave me. And your presence goes before us, your glory has no end, God, you'll never leave me. So I want to talk to you about the call of God. And we're looking at the prophet Isaiah in Isaiah chapter 6. I'm going to read verses 1 through 8, where the scripture says, In the year King Uzziah died, I saw the Lord. He was sitting on a lofty throne, and the train of his robe filled the temple. Hovering around him were mighty seraphim, each with six wings. With two wings they covered their faces, with two they covered their feet, and with the remaining two they flew. In a great chorus they sang, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord Almighty. The whole earth is filled with His glory. The glorious singing shook the temple to its foundations, and the entire sanctuary was filled with smoke. Then I said, My destruction is sealed, for I am a sinful man and a member of a sinful race. Yet I have seen the King, the Lord Almighty. Then one of the seraphim flew over to the altar, and he picked up a burning coal with a pair of tongs. He touched my lips with it and said, See, this coal has touched your lips. Now your guilt is removed and your sins are forgiven. Then I heard the Lord asking, Whom should I send as a messenger to my people? Who will go for us? And I said, Lord, I'll go, send me. Or here I am, Lord, send me. It's a very famous portion of scripture. I want to first look at verse number one where the scripture tells us that Isaiah's encounter with the glory of God, the time that he glimpsed the presence of God in a visible way, was during the season that King Uzziah had died. He had recently passed away. Now, prophets would serve the kings. Prophets would offer their gifting in service of the king. When King Uzziah died, I believe it was symbolic for Isaiah's focus being replaced by the Lord. So his focus, instead of being upon 
the King Uzziah, it was on the King of Kings. So number one, for the called, all other kings must die. Jesus said, no man can serve two masters. You have to love one and hate the other, or love one and reject the other. You can only have one, number one. There is only one priority in your life, and that is the service to your master, Jesus. You see, we like to call him savior. We like to call him healer. We like to call him deliverer because those titles for him are speaking of things that he does for us. But very few people, very few believers, in fact, like the idea of bowing before him as Lord to where he is the Lord over your life. But if you want God to use you, you have to learn to call him Lord. You have to learn to call him master. You have to learn to call him your king. Even if you have to do it every single day anew, crown him Lord of your life. The scripture says that his mercies are new every morning and every morning that you awake is an opportunity for you to offer your life in service to the majesty. It's an opportunity for you to offer your life and say, Lord, I want my life to be used for your glory and I want my life to bring you pleasure. I want my life to please you, God. I want the way I live to cause you to be joyful. I want the way I obey you to cause you to be able to trust me with the deeper things of the spirit, such as revelation, such as more intense power upon my life. I want God to be able to trust me with spiritual matters. And so all other kings must die. There's only one throne on your heart and you have to give that to the Lord. So for the call to number one, all other kings must die. He has to come before ministry. He has to come before your spouse. He has to come before your children. That's right. He has to come before your family. He has to come before your ego. He has to come before your dreams. Now, I know this sounds controversial, but this is what Jesus taught. Jesus said, if, if you don't hate your mother and father, you can't, you can't truly love me. You can't truly follow me. And he wasn't saying that you have to hate them with an immoral hate. He was talking about hating them in comparison to how much we love him. In other words, we reject those who try to call us away from what God has called us to do. Now, let me make this very clear. There is a difference between serving your king and serving your ministry. Your ministry does not come before your family, but God does. Your ministry cannot be your number one priority. God must be your number one priority. All other kings must die. You have to lay down your life. You have to say, Lord, you are not one of many things. You are the only thing. You are the king of kings, and you are the king over my life. Now go down to verse number five. We find that Isaiah the prophet says, Then I said, My destruction is sealed, for I am a sinful man and a member of the sinful race. The scripture says in this same verse in the King James Version, For I am a man of unclean lips, and I dwell in the midst of a people of unclean lips. And he's saying, because of my sin, because of how filthy I am, because of my setbacks and shortcomings, I cannot possibly stand in the glory of God. So let's read this verse again. Then I said, my destruction is sealed. So he thinks he's going to die. For I am a sinful man and a member of a sinful race. But this is key right here. It says, yet I have seen the King, the Lord Almighty. Number two, the called must glimpse the glory of God. You cannot truly be anointed for ministry. You cannot truly be a minister of power and a minister of the gospel unless you for yourself have experienced the glory of God. Anyone who God has ever anointed, whether in scripture or in modern times, anyone who God has ever anointed, had an encounter in the presence of God. You cannot truly be used of God without being first touched by God. It is that divine touch which adds to us that grace and that power to carry out the will of the Father within the earth with true effectiveness. We must encounter the glory of God. There's no getting around it. I can see the difference between those who have substance behind what they say and who do not. I've sat in many conferences, I've heard many preachers, and I can spot the difference between those who have been in the presence of God and those who have not. There is a difference between a minister of the gospel and a public speaker. 
There is a difference of someone who gives superficial encouragement versus someone who talks with supernatural encounter. You see, encouraging people through speech or talking to them through superficial means can only go so far. Human wisdom, human reasoning, human effort can only accomplish so much. But only those who have truly experienced the glory of God, only those who have truly touched something divine can truly be used in an effective way, at least to the point where souls are saved. We're talking about a spiritual work, not a carnal one. We're talking about a supernatural work, not a practical one. We are talking about something that must come from the depths of the soul or of the spirit. You must have an encounter with God. I've seen people try to walk into ministry without having any true encounter with God. They don't have a prayer life. They don't get into the word and they've never truly been touched. So what they have to do is they have to mimic the testimony of others. They have to repeat the sermons of other people. Why? Because they've not truly encountered God for themselves. When you are touched by God, think about that, that God, divine and powerful, would touch a life. That life has favor on it. That life has power on I'm talking about true power. I'm not talking about steps one, two, three to ha have a prophetic gift or steps one, two, three, here's how you give a word of knowledge or how you lay hands on the sick. I am talking about the very glory of God resting upon your being. I'm talking about being someone who carries the presence of Jesus in an authentic way to where when you walk into rooms, everything changes in that room because the glory of God has touched you. But think about that, that God, divine and powerful, would touch a life. You'll see the difference. Remember, the Pharisees saw that the disciples had been with Jesus. They had spent time with Jesus. You have to experience the glory and the presence of God if you are going to step into ministry and truly be used. Don't step out before he's touched your life in that way. Yes, preach the gospel. Yes, minister to people. But never step beyond where God has called you. Never try to give more than you've received as it comes to revelation or the presence and power of God. Now, I'm not trying to discourage you and keep you from growing. In fact, I want to encourage you to grow. But the way you grow is not by sounding spiritual. The way you grow is not by intellect. The way you grow is not by figuring out systems and structures. The way you grow in ministry is by going deeper into the presence of God. Isaiah saw something of God that was so powerful, so vivid, that it frightened him. You know you've been in the glory of God, not because you feel ecstasy, but because you feel a very deep conviction over sin. I want to say that again because some of you need to hear this. You know you've been in the glory of God, not because you experience ecstasy, but because you experience a deep conviction over sin. The deeper you move into the glory of God, the deeper the presence of God grips your heart, the more broken you become over sin. Holiness is a product of a true encounter in the presence of God. When you truly encounter God, there's an awe that comes over you. There's a reverence that comes over you. There is a holy trembling that comes over you. Much of what we see today, and again, I'm not criticizing this. I'm just observing much of what we see. Much of what we see is this very jubilant, celebratory approach, almost this nonchalant approach to the presence of God. We treat the presence of God as if it's a feeling or a sensation or a moment of ecstasy. And you see a lot of laughing, you see a lot of dancing, and that's fine. That is part of experiencing the presence of God because it produces joy. But there are times when you move in the glory of God into places that cause you to almost become frightened. Paul the Apostle said, knowing the terror of the Lord, I persuade men. He saw something in God. It was terrifying. Think about God. Think about how the scripture describes him. Lightning proceeding from the throne, eyes like fire, a voice that sounds like many waters. Think of the glory of God described in Scripture. The glory of God descri described in Scripture is something that inspires awe and reverence, not a nonchalant approach to the presence of God. We must steward that presence. Yes, it produces joy, but it also produces holiness. And so, 
That's number two. The called must glimpse the glory. There's no way around it. It's number one. For the called, all other kings must die. Number two, the called must glimpse the glory of God. And number three, we'll read verses six through seven. Then one of the seraphim flew over to the altar and he picked up a burning coal with a pair of tongs. He touched my lips with it and said, see, this coal has touched your lips. Now your guilt is removed. Isn't that wonderful? And your sins are forgiven. Number three, the called must be cleansed. Now I know I just talked about holiness and truly the key to being cleansed and to being transformed is the presence of Jesus. It's spending time in the presence of God. Remember this, that the time that you least feel like praying is the time that you most likely should pray. So when you feel like you're unworthy, like Isaiah the prophet, remember he said, I am a man of unclean lips. He talked about his speech. For I dwell in the midst of a people of unclean lips. What was it that he felt disqualified him? It was his mouth. Yet think about this. Isaiah spent time in the presence of God. Therefore, the very thing that he thought disqualified him, God used. That's good. I'm excited for that because I know that just set someone free. I felt the anointing on that right now. The very thing that Isaiah thought disqualified him, God used. I feel the anointing. That's setting someone free right now. God took a filthy mouth and made it into a mouthpiece of heaven. God took a man who felt that his speech was filthy and God said, speak for me. That was something that God did in the presence. That was something that happened in the glory. But Isaiah had to allow himself to be cleansed. And you notice God doesn't even respond to Isaiah talking. Isaiah says, I'm disqualified. I'm undone. I'm a man of unclean lips. I dwell in the midst of a people of unclean lips. And God doesn't even respond to that concern in Isaiah. Instead, an angel just moves to cleanse the prophet. Why? Because the angel knew that God was a forgiving God. It was in his nature to be merciful. Now, we must find that time in prayer. We must find that time in the Word. A great and powerful man of God once said that sin will keep you from the Word of God or the Word of God will keep you from sin. You need to spend time in the Word and you need to spend time in the presence of the Holy Spirit. Those two things will keep you clean, will cleanse you. And you have to get those things right if you want God to use you. You can't be going, doing things, or living a lifestyle of sin and be used by God. Listen, I'm not saying that you have to be perfect, but you have to be striving for perfection. And God will use you in proportion to your purity. The power of God upon your life is given in proportion to your purity. Impurity takes up space and it allows nothing to take that space. Purity is emptiness. It's cleanliness. And God can fill emptiness. And so Isaiah the prophet allowed himself to be cleansed. You have to let God clean you up. I know of preachers. I'll never say the names because it's not my business to put that out there. I know of preachers who are living lifestyles of blatant sin. I'm not talking about a mistake and they're struggling. I'm talking that they know it's sin. They continue in that sin and continue just to say, well, it's fine. God will judge that. Listen, there's a difference between striving for holiness and making mistakes and striving for sin. The heart pursues something. It can only pursue one thing. We must pursue righteousness. We must pursue holiness. Again, I'm not saying that if you make mistakes, you're not qualified. That's Then no one could be in ministry. I couldn't even be in ministry. But you know what I do when I make a mistake? I get on my face before God. You know what I want to do when I make a mistake? Go the opposite way. But when I make a mistake before God, and this is what God loves. So let me tell you something I've learned about the Lord. He loves this. He won't despise a broken spirit and a contrite heart. When I make mistakes, when I say something or do something or think something that I know grieves the Holy Spirit of the Lord, I get on my face before God. And I just cry out. I say, Jesus, help me to be more like you. Help me to overcome this. And you know, the truth is that the deeper you go with the Lord, the more sensitive you become to the sin in your life. Sin that you used to do, that you treated as nothing, as you grow closer to the Lord, 
agitates even more. You become more sensitive to sin as you grow deeper in the glory of God. So that's number three, the called must be cleansed. And finally, number four, let's look at verse number eight. Then I heard the Lord asking, whom should I send as a messenger to my people? Who will go for us? And I said, Lord, I'll go, send me. Or here am I, Lord, send me. Number four, the called must volunteer. Here's what I love about this picture. Imagine this, Isaiah the prophet is there in the temple. He's shaken by the vision that he's just seen. The angels are flying about. The temple was shaken to its foundation. He's glimpsing the glory of God. The train of God's robe is filling the temple. He's being cleansed of problems in his nature. He's being transformed into a new man. He's becoming the mouthpiece of heaven. God is anointing him in this moment. The glory of God surrounds him. And the Lord, looking around the temple, nobody else there, says, who will I send? Why didn't he just ask Isaiah, will you go for me? It's because he wanted Isaiah to say, here I am, Lord, send me. You have got to present yourself before the Lord. Sure, he's searching. But God will not use an unwilling vessel. You say, what about Jonah? Well, Jonah eventually repented and he went. Sure, God will use the stubborn as long as they eventually obey. I'd rather just be one to say, here I am, Lord, send me. I don't want to be someone that God has to fight. I want to be someone that God works with. Sure, the Lord will pursue the called. You have to volunteer. You have to surrender and say, here I am, Lord, send me. I want to be used for the glory of God. And I believe that's you. I believe that's something that you need to pray right now. I really feel it. You need to say to the Lord right now, I'm tired of running. I'm tired of procrastinating. I'm tired of disqualifying myself because of uncleanliness. I want, I want to be qualified. Let him clean you. Don't let your insecurities keep you from pursuing the God. It's time to just say, Lord, I just want your will in my life. I just want to be used by you. You know that deep within your soul, there is a burning desire to be used for the glory of God. You know you have gifts. You know you share a connection with the Lord. There's a reason you watch this channel. There's a reason you're attracted to the deeper things of the Spirit. It's because you are called by God. And God wants to use your life, but you have to lay it down. You have to say, Lord, here am I. Send me. I will not run from this anymore. I'm going to be used for your glory. I want you to spend me for your glory. Use my life. Anoint me, Father. Let's agree right now. I want you to pray. Say this. Say, Lord Jesus, I surrender all. Say, here I am. Send me. Say it again. Here I am, Lord. Send me. Father, I pray for that one watching right now, that one receiving this prayer. Touch and fill them, Lord, and use them for your glory, I pray. In the mighty name of Jesus, we agree, touching this thing, saying, Amen. Say it if you believe it. Amen. Well, that is it for the lesson. I want to welcome now the new members of Spirit Church. There you are up on the screen. We love you. We are praying for you. I always say that because I always mean it. If you'd like information on how you could become a part of the Spirit family and join Spirit Church, it's completely free. Then go ahead and go to davidhernandezministries.com slash spiritchurch. I'm going to get to your comments now, and after the comments, I'm going to talk to you for a moment, so don't turn off this video. These comments are from last week's teaching. Now remember, last week I was not here. I was out of town on a pastor's retreat. Stephen introduced last week's archive teaching. So it was a repeat, but it was on receiving financial breakthrough. And so here are the comments. The first commenter writes, Thank you, Pastor David, for the great message. I was so blessed. I always feel blessed every time I watch your YouTube channel and hearing God's word. God bless you more. The next commenter writes, Pastor David, my husband and I have sowed and tithed generously over the years, but I was still frustrated. Now I finally realize we need to be more disciplined with what we have. After watching this, I was convicted and learned we needed to be better stewards over what we have. 
I believe our business will prosper after watching this video. I believe it too. You know, you often hear prosperity preachers, they just give you the spiritual side of it because all they want is your money. They tell you if you just give, 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 God will give you breakthrough. That's part of it. You do need to be generous. You do need to sow into the kingdom of God. But the other side of it is you also need to be a good steward of what you have. There's more on that in last week's teaching, Receiving Financial Breakthrough. Lisa J. writes, Preach, Pastor David. This is a good word. Shane Megan writes, Thanks, Brother in Christ, for sharing this wonderful word as a teaching to us. I am much blessed to get this video. It means God is still saying something in my life. May God bless you more. And the final commenter writes, Brother David, God bless you. You are a true man of God. This is the voice of the Holy Spirit. This message was for me. Please keep me in your prayers. God bless you more. Well, we sure do love you guys. And our YouTube viewers are like family. It's one big family from all around the world. We have our YouTube viewers, our Facebook viewers, our, um, I can just go on. There's all these different venues and avenues and platforms that they get the program on and through. But I want to talk to you now about helping our ministry. Now, don't turn off the video. You know, I want to win more souls. And the truth is that the gospel is free, but the means to deliver it, it gets costly. So there are two effective ways to truly spread the gospel. One is to preach the gospel directly to the non-believer, which we do through our events. And the second, which is just as effective, possibly more. Who knows? Only the Lord will know. But the second way is to build believers and therefore multiply yourself in them and cause them to become themselves preachers of the gospel or people who spread the good news. You don't have to be a pastor to preach the gospel. So what we do at this ministry is twofold. We do media and events. We evangelize and we edify. We evangelize the lost and we edify the believer. And we want to expand that to greater and greater ways. So help us in this campaign. Look at how close we are. Here we are. We needed a thousand new $30 a month partners. Here's where we are now. Now listen, what we're going to do with this new support is we're going to get a new facility, and that facility is going to house production. We're going to do live broadcasts, weekly or regular services. We're going to have a 24-7 prayer room, and we're going to be able to do more media content more often, higher quality. We'll be able to put it out and reach, I believe, millions. Second, we're also, with that financial support, going to be able to do more events more often and in more locations. So help us to do this. Help us spread the gospel by becoming a $30 a month partner. You sign up today to become a $30 a month partner and we'll send you either Carriers of the Glory or 25 Truths About Demons and Spiritual Warfare. Be my partner, do this for the long run, help me win souls, let's expand this ministry, let's do something big for God together. So go ahead, wait till the end of this video. If you're watching this on YouTube at the end of this video, a link is going to appear right at the end. Click that link. Sign up to become a partner today. No, no, no more delay. Let's do this. Let's get this going. And I know the Lord will bless you for it. We want to win souls. We want to build believers and do that through media and events. And again, you're going to help us to move into that new facility. And you're going to help us to do more events in more locations and more often. So go ahead and click on that. I'm going to say my usual ending here and then click on the link that appears right after that. That is it for this edition of Spirit Church. Until next time, remember, nothing is impossible with God. Thank you for watching Encounter TV. Don't forget to subscribe. Also, help me win souls by spreading the gospel through events and media. Make a one-time donation or become a monthly supporter by clicking on the donate link now.